So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ernesto Amaral. I'm going to be the professor for this class, Population Society. And um, I will present today this syllabus. And also, if we have time, con con uh, start on the, the first lecture about introduction to demography. You might have seen that um, the Canvas um, website is already working. And in that Canvas website, you have the link to my personal website where I'm going to save the files for this class here, including the lectures and also some extra videos and so on. But just a little bit of background about me. I'm originally from Brazil. I got a PhD in sociology with a concentration demography from UT Austin. I went back to Brazil, worked there for a while as a professor. And then I went to LA, worked in a research institute, the Rand Corporation. And in 2017, I joined here, Texas A&M. And um, yeah, I, I started as an assistant professor. I was recently promoted to associate professor. So we're going to meet here on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 12.45 to 2 p.m. I was just having some technological problems here that I could not access my files in this computer but I just downloaded from my own website here. So this is the main place where you're gonna download files from for this class. In the Canvas website, that's where we're gonna do uh, the exams, the final exam and the quizzes that we're gonna have throughout the semester. I'm gonna explain it to you. And I'm also planning to record what I'm doing here right now and post it on, on my YouTube channel. In these last two semesters, I did do like the hybrid class that some students would be in person, some students will be uh, from home attending on Zoom Live. And, uh, but I also put the, the, the recording on YouTube and let's see if in this classroom is gonna work because in some classrooms I had trouble. And I don't take attendance as I'm gonna uh, mention later here. So if you guys are concerned, with getting infected and so on, you can just watch the lecture afterwards. But just remember to take the quizzes on the days that they will be open on Canvas. So just to show you the course website, this course website here, how it's organized. So it's pretty much, if you don't remember that full thing, you can just go to ernestramaral.com. This is my picture before the pandemic. And, and here on the left, uh, teaching demography, our class 2021 fall, population and society. And then it gets us into that link that it's in the syllabus, okay? The full syllabus is also here to download in PDF. You can also download it already from, from Howdy. It's also there. The Canvas website, it's gonna be pretty simple because it's pretty much for you guys to do the assignments, quizzes, and um, check your grades. But if you go there, your view is gonna be something like this. You pretty much just have this major page where I show my email, the course website, where the, the recorded le lectures will be, and information about office hours as well. The assignments, they will appear here. Right now, there, there are no assignments. And your grades will appear here. And also, if I send emails to the whole class, I will also save them as announcements in this uh, website. So in my view here, the annou announcements will be saved here whenever I send emails, I will just save it here as well. And the assignments, whenever they appear, we're gonna have a total of 20 quizzes and four exams, including the final exam. Okay, so it's gonna be done all here, all open book. And uh, we, in the days of the exams, we will not have in-person classes. You, you can take the exam wherever you want. So this can just continue here in the website. 
uh, more information, office hours, I will be available for office hours. I mean, usually when I set up a couple of hours in a specific day of the week, usually some students might have classes during those days. So there are some chairs if you want. Sit. If you want to stand, that's okay, chair. What's that? You can go around maybe. <laughs> Thank you guys. So usually if I set up a time for office hours in specific uh, day of the week, some of you might have classes. So I just keep it more open, more flexible. So whenever you wanna have uh, office hours, just send me an email when we schedule a time and we're gonna meet on this uh, Zoom link. And um, some people might want face-to-face -face office hours. I prefer virtual office hours. And but we can discuss that as well if you want. Uh, if you have questions, usually I know that students come after class to ask one on one questions to the professor. I prefer that you guys don't do that. And I will just answer questions by email or also on office hours. OK, so um, quizzes and exams, as I said, it's going to be all on Canvas and here are instructions about the quizzes and exams. You pretty much we're gonna have quizzes at the end of specific class days at 2 p.m. The quiz is gonna open in Canvas and it's gonna close at 8 p.m. in the following day. And it's gonna, we're gonna have like 22 multiple choice questions. But once you open the quiz, you have five minutes to answer the two questions. Okay, and it's that style that I have a question bank. Two questions get selected randomly. You can just see one question at a time. Once you answer the first one, you go to the second one and you cannot go back. And uh, also the, the categories are randomized as well. So here information about quizzes, two questions at 0.5 points each. And the exams will be worth a total of 20 points. 40 multiple choice questions, also 0.5 points each. And the final exam, it's not cumulative. So the final exam is kind of like an exam four. It's just whatever we saw after the, the content of exam three. And the final exam is actually easier than the exam because the exam you're gonna have the same style. In the day of the exam, the exam is gonna open in Canvas from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Once you start it, you have one hour and 15 minutes to complete it, the same amount of time that we are in the classes here. But for the final exam, according to university rules, it's open for two hours and 30 minutes. So you have the double of the time to answer. And the same amount of questions, not cumulative. So exams one, two, and three, technically they are harder uh, than the final exam, right? And here just some tips. Don't take too long on specific questions. For quizzes, we have on average two minutes and 30 seconds to respond to each question. Exam, one minute, 52 seconds, and the final exam, more time. Okay. So this file is available in the course website as well. And here we start with the lectures. So the lecture about introduction to demography is here already. You can download it as a PDF file. And I will also add specific extra material under each one of these topics. So here I have a short article by Dudley Poston. Dudley Poston uh, is a retired professor from the sociology department here at A&M. And he was the one teaching this class before me. And, uh, and I just put this article here, a short article that he talks about cohort definitions. And I just put some uh, videos here. Everything, it's extra material, these videos. Uh, that you have also information about, in this case, introduction to demography. The one below here, Hans uh, Rosling, he was a public health researcher and he was really, really good of showing statistical data uh, in a really friendly way. And he has, he developed a software and he created this company gap minder and has series of graphs, figures, maps, and videos 
to try to explain statistics, statistics in a friendly way. A short video done by the New York Times, a silly song about population, just silly things. And then we just keep going, right? If you click on this link here, it's not gonna, you are not gonna be able to access the files. So I did not upload yet the lectures after this first one. But if there is any other link that you try to access in this page that doesn't work, please let me know. Only the lecture links starting here should not work yet. I will upload them throughout the semester. If any other of these links don't work or video is not appearing anymore because someone took it out from YouTube, just let me know and I will update the website, okay? Uh, here we will focus on age and sex composition. And, and these examples that I usually put in Excel, I just get a group of Excel files and I compress them in a zip file. So here is pretty much a zip file. You uncompress it and you can see some examples of tables, graphs, how you can generate them by yourself. You get data, for example, online or from a publication, how you can do it, in this case, related to age and sex composition. The videos also related to population age, uh, about age and sex uh, uh, composition. The next topics, word population change over time. And I changed the order of the, the topics in the, um, from the textbook. And uh, just to here, just to give you already some examples of major trends in population in the world and in the US. And then we're gonna have our first exam after that. Okay, so that's the, I just wanted to show here the structure of the website. This one was an animation made by a, a colleague of mine uh, Matt Hauer from Florida State University. He's an assistant professor uh, in the sociology department. And I think it's just really cool, a really funny way to, to explain theories of demography. Population Reference Bureau usually collects data about several countries related to population, to demography. And this is a, a video done by them related to theories of demography, this major topic here. And then it goes. The whole um, course website. And then afterwards, after the final exam here, I'm gonna I show here a series of links with, I mean, about the pandemic, about several other topics in demography, the links from, EU, uh, from the US Census Bureau, demographic resources. And I will show some of them to you in the class about sources of demographic information. So I will talk about some of them in that specific class. Again, if any of these sites, if any of these links don't work, if you click there is an error message, please let me know and I will correct it. Cool mortality, fertility, migration data, and so on. So that's the, the style of the course website. And the Canvas website, as I mentioned, is just, um, uh, is just uh, for us to submit uh, quizzes and assignments, quizzes and exams. This is the YouTube page that I have. So the, my lectures from these last semesters, they are here, what I call here introduction to demography is pretty much our class population and society from last spring, from fall 2020 and from spring 2020. So they are here. And my idea is to create a similar one for fall 2021, right? And this is just extra stuff from all the presentations that I have there. Okay. Uh, I already passed through this. This class, we're gonna talk about demography. This class is an introduction to demography. This class is an introduction to population studies. And basically we're gonna discuss more in depth the three components in demography, fertility, mortality, and migration. So the classes will be subdiv subdivided into these three major topics. At the beginning, as I said, I'm gonna give an overall 
idea of what demography is, and then talk about uh, the trends in population in the world, in the, in the US, theories of demography, and then go specific on these three uh, components of demography. Whenever we do a study of demography, that we are not focusing only on uh, estimations, only on formulas, only on how to estimate population trends. We are trying to understand, okay, I can show you some basic ways to estimate some rates, fertility, mortality, migration, but I also want you to interpret them, critically interpret them, changes over time, compare different areas and so on. Whenever we do this analysis of population that we are just not focused on the mathematical ways of estimating population trends, we are trying to understand, we are trying to interpret the populations and try to understand the specific concepts where those populations are located. We are doing a study related to social demography, right? So social demography is this critical study of population, or another way to say the sociological study of population. If you were just focusing on methods, on how to estimate it, that would be a class on uh, demographic techniques, or we could also call it formal demography, okay? But in this case here, this class is related to social demography. So, and we're gonna talk more about this. Demo demography is the scientific study of population, and we are not just concerned about changes in the size, but also in the composition and distribution of these populations. And we also try want to understand changes over time. And these are all several topics that we're gonna uh, discuss in the class, uh, uh, where we discuss general concepts, what are periods, cohorts, the Lexis uh, diagram in, in demography, and then I will go specifically about mortality, fertility, and migration topics, okay? And this, all these sections here in the syllabus, I try to follow them, the mandatory subsections that we have in the university. That's why I had to put this one about the prerequisites. Course learning, uh, learning outcomes, what we expect to learn by the end of the semester in this class. Identify main concepts and methods in demography related to fertility, mortality, and migration. Explain links between demographic changes, economic outcomes, public policy. So some more critical study of demography, not just trying to understand formulas, but trying to understand how demography is related to other areas in our society. Evaluate the general demographic trends throughout the world based on, um, on data that's available for free that was collected by other entities, by other institutions, data that was collected by other institutions is secondary data. So if I'm saying that I'm analyzing secondary data because I'm analyzing a data that someone else collected. Primary data is usually when I collect my own data. Perceive, analyze, and discuss the dynamics of human populations. And some of these analysis can be done with the secondary data. And some examples of the secondary, secondary data are exactly those links that I just showed you fast in my website at the bottom of the course website. And finally, investigate population issues from the perspective of the social sciences. The textbook, it is available in the university uh, bookstore at the MSC. I just put here the link to Amazon, but of course it's available here at MSC again. I just didn't put it there because there was no direct link that it would take to that page that I wanted to show. It just shows the, the general page. I don't know why. But it's pretty much this uh, book written by exactly Dudley Poston, the retired professor, the same guy who I used to teach this class before. You can either rent or buy it. It's not... The, the price varies pretty much like on a daily basis, I guess. I mean, in Amazon at least. So they're different. You can buy it new, used. Also, you can uh, buy on Kindle in the case of Amazon. And uh, yeah, so this prices vary a lot. There is the first edition, 
But as uh, Dudley Post mentions at the beginning of this book, the second edition is different than the first one. I would recommend you having the second edition. This one that was published in 2017. And throughout the semester, we show you examples on the topics that he mentions in this textbook with newer data beyond 2017. So I show you some graphs, some, some data for the world and for the US uh, that's not just examples from the textbook. I show more recent examples as well. And all this material will be available in the course website, as I told you. The, um, this is the overall grading policy. We're going to have the four exams, including final exam, 20% each one, and the quizzes. So we're going to have pretty much 20 quizzes, one point each quiz. So it's going to be two questions. I could have put in here two questions. 0.5 points each question. The quizzes, whenever we have them, as they are, I'm going to show here in the calendar, they will open at 2 p.m. at the day of the class and will be open until 8 p.m. in the following day. A lot of people that don't show up to class or even show up, they forget to take the quiz. I don't know how. But the quizzes are a significant portion of the final grade. It's pretty much two letter grades that you can increase or decrease because of quizzes. Because of that little work every day, it can increase a lot your final, uh, your final grade, right? So just do the quizzes, just try to do it, take your time. You have five minutes once you open it to answer two questions. As I mentioned, exams will be given online, open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. on the exam days. There will be no face-to-face -face classes on the exam days, so you can take these exams wherever you, you can take at home, you can take in the library, just in front of a computer that has connection to the internet, okay? And um, yeah, the dates I will show you later here, the final exam, it's going to be open also from 8 a.m. on 8 to 8 p.m. on the day stipulated by the university. Just looking at this link here, that's the date that I put at the bottom of the, the syllabus. And the quizzes, again, from 2 to p.m. to in a specific class day until 8 p.m. in the next day. The exams and the, the exam one, of course, is going to cover the, the, the material that I'm talking since today until the day, the class before exam one. Exam two is going to be the content after exam one until right before exam two. So not cumulative. Quizzes are cumulative. There are only two questions, but in the middle of the semester, I can ask, you can have any question related to any topic that we saw starting from today, okay? So quizzes, since it's, uh, we have fewer questions, they can be about any topic that we discussed up to that point. This file here in this link, it's exactly the one that I showed to you guys before that breaks down the amount of minutes that you have per question in the quizzes, exams, and file exam. Do not miss them. Every point is important for your grade. All assessments will not be graded on a curve. I don't do that, okay? So that's actually a stimulus for you guys to study together, to create that group me uh, account for you guys to discuss any topics related to the, to the class. Grade is will not be rounded up. Whatever number appears on Canvas, and automatically calculates your final grade, gonna be it. 59.9 is an F. Nine is a D, not a C, right? So every quiz matters. Every point, every 0.5 points matter. Cool? Exactly because I'm not uh, grading on a curve, you're not competing with others in class to be in a specific location of the curve. 
So feel free to form study groups. All exams and quizzes are open book, but I just ask you guys, whenever you are doing them, to do them individually, right? It's open book. You can read the textbook. You can read your notes that you write in the classroom. You can look at my slides. You can look at anything. There is a time limit, but you can look at anything. I just don't ask you to do it by yourself. There will be no camera looking at you in Canvas either. It's more based on trust, okay? The, this is the tentative calendar. It varies a lot. It varies from the classroom. Sometimes I just keep giving examples and it's longer to cover a specific chapter, a chapter than I expected. Sometimes we have great conversations and questions in the classroom and then we take longer. But that's the general idea here. The P here is the post on book. And here I indicate the chapter that's going to be talked in that specific day. Right, so chapter one starting today. Uh, even the first chapter, don't think I can cover in two uh, classes only. Maybe we're gonna be able to finish this next week. See that quizzes start just next week. So at 2 p.m. on September 7th, the first quiz is gonna uh, open on Canvas. Why not before? Because the deadline for people to add and drop classes, it's September 3rd. So I wait until that to start grading people in this class. Okay. So people who enter the class afterwards, I don't have to reopen a quiz because of that. And the, as I mentioned, this, the content here can overlap. It might take more time to cover chapter one, more time to cover chapter 10, 12, and 13. But the dates of the exams are set. So exam one will happen on September 23rd, okay? And we'll cover whatever material we talked until the previous lecture on September 21st, okay? And another thing that you're gonna realize is that the day after exams, we don't have quizzes but then they're gonna come back afterwards. And then we're gonna talk about theories of demography. Theories of demography is kind of, what is our previous knowledge that we have about demography, trying to explain changes in fertility, mortality, and migration that help us understand changes that we are seeing nowadays, right? So all this previous knowledge that we have about population. And that's the topic about theories of demography. It usually tends to be a little bit more theoretical, but I try to give some examples. There are sources of demographic information. That's when I'm going to show you some examples of those websites where you can collect some data related to demography online for free. And then we're going to co uh, cover the chapters about fertility and start mortality and have exam two. Okay. And exam two from the topics discussed from nine to 15. And see that I relate to the numbers, not to the content, because we might take more time to talk about each one of these chapters. Continue on mortality, and then we go into internal migration, international migration, exam three, finish international migration. And then the chapter about race and ethnicity. These final chapters, Family and sexuality, contraception and, and birth control. Usually I cover if we have time, but probably we might not have time. And this is extra reading within the fertility topic. So you might not be able to cover it, but I will post the lectures related to those chapters in the course website if you want to read them, even if we don't cover. The same thing about these final chapters in the textbook, chapters 14 to 16. Okay. Um, so I'm affiliated to the, the sociology department here at the university. And we have this statement written by faculty and also with the help of uh, students about diversity and civility statement about 
diversity and civility. And the major idea here is sociological topics, even demography that might, some people might think that's really objective. Sociological topics can be really controversial, right? Can bring all passionate thoughts that we might have in our lives. Uh, fertility, I just mentioned, it's related to birth control. It comes with topics about abortion and so on. Mortality brings up topics related to race, ethnicity, differences in mortality, inequality. A lot of different topics that we have, controversial topics that we have in, in, in this country and in the world. Migration. The last two presidential elections in the US focused a lot on migration or international migration. On some people emphasize the negative effects of international migration without any data to support that. Here, I'm gonna use scientific data, scientific analysis to cover any one of these topics. If you want to disagree, if you want to uh, come up with another perspective, that's awesome. In a respectful way to everybody else in the classroom and based on science only. This class is based on science, right? We are at the university. This is population and society, the data, the methods, the analysis based on science. Social science should be more specifically. And in a really respectful way with everybody, even based on data, we might have different opinions, interpretations, but let's just be respectful, okay? Because we have seen uh, some problems in the classroom related to people not respecting diversity and civility in the classroom. So that's what we are trying to make it really clear with this statement. Again, I will not take attendance in each class. And related to the previous statement, hate speech will not be accepted in the classroom. Be respectful. And some other things here, some other resources that you have in the university. We will not be actually doing a lot of uh, written assignments. I might maybe give some extra point activities and that would be open essay assignments. If you have any difficulty writing, putting your thoughts into, into the keyboard, into the computer, there are resources that you can uh, try to look at the university to help you with that. And usually these open essay assignments for extra credit activities, I give more time for you to write. So there is time to use this, um, resources in the university. I ask you guys to, whenever you are using a computer or any electronic device in the classroom, focus on the topic that we are using here. Take your notes, look at the website, download the lecture related to the topics that we are discussing in the classroom at the moment. Uh, you will complete the course evaluation pretty much great in the class and the professor. As you know, I think we started last, I think it was last fall, with this new uh, system, the AFs, you should be that PICA. But just remember to, um, to do this course evaluation. In previous semesters, I would give extra points to the class if at least, I don't know, 80% of the classroom answered this, this course evaluation, but that was forbidden by the Senate of the university, so I cannot do that anymore. <laughs> so that's why I'm not doing it. Office hours, I expect you guys to come with doubts. I will not give the full lecture again during office hours. I would prefer to have office hours virtually on Zoom on the link that I already showed you. But just come with specific questions. I'd be glad to help. And usually in office hours, in one-on-one -on -one interactions, and even virtual is actually better than in person because I can share my screen, I can show you some examples, I can show an Excel file, I can show a lecture graph. It's much more dynamic, right? It's easier to actually teach that than if we are just uh, across the table or something like that. Students are not allowed to submit their coursework after the due date. Work submitted by a student has uh, 
as a makeup work for an excuse absence is not considered late work. So if there is any reason that's considered an excused absence, you had an accident or something, got sick because of the pandemic or anything like that, that is part of the student rule seven, then you can have uh, the chance to do uh, that specific quiz or exam in, in another opportunity. But besides that, there is no, I will not reopen quizzes or exams, right? It's just for excused absences listed on student rule number seven. These policies here are just university policies that's again mandatory and it's just a copy and they really require that. We just copy and paste from the, the A&M Senate document. So you might have seen this from the other uh, syllabi, from other classes that you have. Uh, the university views class attendance and participation as individual student responsibility. So you're expected to attend the class and complete all assignments. Because of the pandemic, because people might be worried of coming to the classroom, such a small classroom here with, uh, when we have the possibility of having 72 students at this point, at least earlier today, we had 71 students enrolled. So if you feel that's not safe, you can watch the lectures uh, online. Afterwards, I will post them online. Let's see if this recording is gonna, is gonna work today. Uh, makeup work policy, also just following the university. If uh, the, you could not attend the class for a reason listed in student rule number seven, so you can just request me to reopen the quiz or reopen the exam that you missed because of that specific reason, right? So that's the major idea here. Onegi doesn't lie, cheat or steal or tolerate those who do. And, and this policy, this statement are really, the whole course is based on, is, is based on it because like all the, the exams and quizzes are open book. The only thing that I'm asking is for you guys to do it by yourself and not doing groups. And um, so I really expect you guys to, to follow the university statement. Uh, for students that have any sort of disability, you have, if you have difficulty hearing me, I really don't like wearing a mask and talking for one hour and 15 minutes, but I follow science. I'm annoying. So I wear a mask when I'm surrounded by so many people. And I, um, some people might have difficulty to understand me because of my accent, because my uh, mouth being covered. So you might want to, for me to use that clear mask, which is even worse than this one. But if it's required by the Disability Resource Service, I will have to do it. Some people might need the double of the time to answer quizzes and exams for any reason that they might have. I just have, I need you to go to this, um, to the Disability Center, re uh, report it to them. They will give you a, a, a letter and you just send me that letter and all this accommodations will be done for you, okay? More time to answer quizzes, exams, and, and whatever thing might be needed for you. And you don't have to tell me what specific disability you have, right? That's all confidential. Title IX and Statement on Limits of Confidentiality. All this section here, is related by uh, for people that experience any problem related to sexual harassment or prejudice, discrimination in the university. Any employee at the university, such as me, faculty, staff, we are, you can report any issue that you might experience in the university or even outside the university to any one of the university employees. But one thing that we have to emphasize is that as a faculty member, I'm a mandatory reporter. What does it mean? If any issue happens with you with sexual harassment, sexual violence, prejudice, discrimination, so on, and you report that to me, I am obligated 
to report it to my to my supervisor, to the head of the department, or to another uh, someone dealing with this issue at the university, to another center at the university. I cannot keep it only to myself. So there are limits on my on the confidentiality. I have to report it to other to my my supervisor. And then the supervisor the other or the other center might access contact the person, but the person might refuse to, to go forward, right? I'm a mandatory reporter, but if someone else come up to you to try to solve the problem and you don't want it, you can just say, no, I don't want any more help. I'm okay the way that it is, okay? And so that's the, the whole, what this whole topic is saying. It's major issues that we have been seeing that's not uh, rare. We receive emails from the university about all these issues throughout the semester, throughout the years here. I mean, I don't even can count all these issues that we have been receiving. The policy in the university should make it really transparent so it's reported to everybody. So it happens. And there's the, the counseling psychological services. They, if you report to them, they keep it confidential. But if you report to me, I either we report it to CAPS or to the head of the department, okay? But if they access you, you don't have to follow up if you don't want to. Can even ignore their calls if you don't want it. Um, there are also a several, I have encountered already students that had issues with mental health and wellness. And again, the counseling and psychological services, it's, uh, it's out there for help for these issues. Phone number, the time frame, and uh, oh, and, the, and on weekends it's also twenty four hours. It's available there, and you can also access information for help related to mental health on this link. True. This is an optional statement that the Senate faculty gave to us. To help protect egg land and stop the spread of COVID-19, Texas a and University urges students to be vaccinated, to wear masks in classrooms and all their academic facilities on campus, including labs. As I said, it's really hard for me to teach with a mask. I'm sweating, it's difficult, it's annoying. And I, it's even hard to drink water. I used to drink water when I was teaching. Now I usually don't because of the mask. Um, it's not mandatory, of course. If you want to wear it, you wear it. But it's also a matter of individual, group, and societal responsibility, right? It's pretty much like I have uh, four-year-old twins. My son, I have a, a, a son and a daughter. My son, when he, he was born, he had lung problems. So he was at the NIQ, at the intensive care for seven days because his lungs are not, were not well developed. Even nowadays, if he gets any cold or anything, he really struggles to recover it. So it's kind of like an asthma for, for kids. He's now four years old, but so that's why I'm being careful because he's not vaccinated. I am vaccinated, but I don't want to pass it to him so that's why we keep wearing a mask. And also, even if I'm vaccinated, I can pass it to other people. Other people who might be vaccinated can get sick. I also have my father-in-law who recently went to the hospital with pneumonia. I don't want to pass this to him. You might have a series of other individual examples in your family, among your friends. And if you want to think about the society as a whole, we have seen how the percentage of uh, beds in hospitals have been increasing, the use of them, the increased use of ICU intensive care because of people uh, contaminated with COVID-19. So I think about the ones close to me, but I also think about the society as a whole with my decision to wear a mask. And of course, that's completely optional for anyone at the university, as everybody knows, not mandatory. It's more a philosophical, a health, a public health 
option to use it, to wear the mask. Uh, this, whenever we put, I put this link to the student rule number seven in this my syllabus for previous years. I would always uh, it would be sound like kind of abstract to students. So I just went there to the website and I got some extracts about the student rule number seven to be recorded really clear in my syllabus. In case of absences, the student must provide notification of excuse absences to the instructor in writing. In nowadays email is the best way, so just send me an email prior to the date of absence. In cases where advanced notification is not possible, the student must provide notification by the end of the second business day after the last day of absence. This notification must include an explanation of why notice could not be sent before. Why I'm doing all this? Because of the 20 quizzes that we have. We have 20 quizzes throughout this semester and for exams. You might miss some of them, but you have to report if you miss a class because of an excused absence list on the student rule number seven, but you have a specific timeline to do that for me, right? By the end of the second business day after the last day of the absence. Only again, excused absence is defined by the university acceptable as listed here. The student is responsible for providing documentation substantiating the reason for the excused absence, including specifically what's the reason listed on, on section 7.2 of student rule seven that your absence falls in, into. This documentation must be provided within three business days. Three business days of the last day of absence, unless otherwise stated in this rule. Makeup work must be completed in the time frame not to, ex to exceed 30 calendar days from the last day of the initial absence. If you miss like towards the end of the semester and you miss a class, I might just keep your grade uh, as incomplete and then you complete the final exams and activities, grade you and then upload the correct grade if that's more towards the end of the semester. In summary, students must submit explanation about excused absence by email to professor with attached documentation listing the exact item within section 7.2.2 that refers to the absence. Okay. Any questions? Oh, cool. So I was having problems downloading my files here in this computer. So I just went to my website here and I downloaded the lecture that I had already uploaded there, chapter one. So this, uh, where is it? Uh, where's the file explorer? Oh, it's here. So it's in a PDF format, it's not in a PowerPoint format here. I think it usually works well as well. Uh, full screen mode. I hope it doesn't start walking. So this is this um, lecture is based on chapter one, but I expanded. You're gonna see that a lot of like topics that I will cover in this class here uh, are not on chapter one. Whatever thing I talk in the classroom, examples, even examples outside of the slides, examples in the slides, they can also be part of questions in the exams and quizzes, okay? Those videos, extra readings in the course website, they, they are extra, but slides within like examples within these slides and examples that I give that I think right now here, they can become questions in our quizzes and exams. This specific class is divided in these subtopics here. First, trying to understand what is demography. So the definition of demography, 
show you a basic demographic equation. Again, we're not focusing here on the equations, but it's just this basic equation just to understand the major components in demography, fertility, mortality, and migration. And then I will talk a little bit about variables and observations. What is a database? Because based on that information, we can understand a series of other topics that we're gonna discuss throughout the semester. Give you some data about the, the current data about the pandemic. The data that's there now, it's from today, August 31st. And, um, and this is an example of, ex of exactly variables and observations and apply to a topic that we are experiencing right now. Talk about different demographic models that we have uh, in the study of demography and social demography. What are cohorts and generations? To understand cohorts, a good tool to understand cohort is a graph called the Lexis diagram. So the Lexis diagram is just a tool that we have to better understand changes over time in the size and composition of the population, usually by age. And also we take it for granted that people know the, dif the differences between ratios, rates, and probabilities, but it's good to make it clear. What are the differences between ratios, rates, and probabilities? Why we have something called dependency ratio, but then we have total fertility rate. Why one is called rate and the other one is called ratio, All right? So we're gonna discuss that. So it's just the way that you measure specific indicators, they will be classified as ratios, race, ra uh, rates, or probabilities. Uh, the major definition that I will talk about when I will talk about demography, and this is information available in the course, in the, tech, uh, in the course textbook. Demography is a scientific study of human population. And this term was coined by the Belgian statistician Archille Guillard, the Alemán de Statistique Humaine or Demographic uh, Comparé, pretty much saying that we are trying to understand changes in the size and composition of the population using human statistics and trying to compare demographic changes over time for the same population or, demo or how we experience different patterns and levels of demographic indicators across populations, okay? So, and again, based on scientific data, basic, uh, based on scientific knowledge. This term you might have, you might hear if you have not already, some people saying that demography is destiny. It's a strong statement. Nowadays, people don't use it as much, but it's reported in the textbook. And it was uh, kind of thought by this French mathematician and philosopher, Auguste Comte, who is known to be the father of sociology. His main idea here is to say that demography shapes the world, shapes the way that our population is organized even it's, if it's not the major factor that makes the population how it is today, maybe demography is the result of other changes that a specific population experienced, but demography actually shows how a population is. And it gives us an idea of how this population is gonna be in the future. So I usually don't say that this demography is destiny, but demography, makes us understand how a specific population was, how a specific population is nowadays, and how we can also expect that population to be in the future based on this previous knowledge, okay? Population change is, underlying, is an underlying component of almost everything happening in the world today and therefore in the future as well. I mean, the pandemic is a clear case. The pandemic affect, affect the economy, increase unemployment rates, and that affects the well-being of the population. Usually people, when they face this kind of economic hardships, in this case related to the pandemic, they start to have fewer children. So affects fertility. Affecting fertility, the proportion of children in these next years 
we expect it to be lower than it is today, not just because fertility was already dropping, but because of the pandemic. Because of the pandemic, it got it harder to have both internal migration, people moving within countries, and international migration, people moving between countries. And of course, because of the pandemic, mortality rates increased, and that has an overall impact on the life expectancy at birth. What is life expectancy at birth? The average number of years that we expect to live based on the mortality levels of a specific population. So all these things that are happening nowadays in the world, they shape demographic composition. In this case, I gave examples for all the components, fertility, mortality, and migration. And afterwards, that demographic composition will shape how our population is gonna be in the future. With fewer children, you're gonna need less resources to, to invest in schools. But then as these children get older and go to the labor market, then we're gonna have a higher proportion of older people comparing to people in labor ages. And that's gonna be an issue related to the retirement system. So demographic composition is affected by things that happen in previous generations and has effects for years to come, right? So the pandemic will have effects in these next decades. Another important kind of like, I would say a classical demographer is John Grant. He was an English statistician considered to be the founder of demography. And he analyzed vital uh, statistics of the London population, vital statistics, and I feel information about uh, birth certificates, death certificates about the population in London some centuries ago. So he was, he just went and analyzed this data in a more systematic scientific way. And he published this work related to major trends and patterns that he observed in mortality. So he pretty much studied these bills of mortality, weekly statistics of deaths in early modern London. More specifically, he studied the death records that had been kept by the London parishes since 1532. And that's crazy, right? I mean, he is like in the 1600s and then getting data from a century before and he can do all this detailed information, and understand the levels, the patterns of mortality of the population from that time. And from that study, he realized, he found some regularities in mortality for that specific population that he published in the book, Natural and Political Observations Made Upon the Bills of Mortality. And his major findings, and this, let's say here, his major substantive contributions, the knowledge about patterns of mortality from that time, he recognized the phenomenon of rural uh, urban migration, like people moving from rural to urban areas. He kind of was able to measure people being born in a specific place and dying in another place. And most of that were people moving from rural to urban areas. And at that time, by measuring the death rates, he saw that the urban death rates exceeded the rural death rates, which is the opposite that we have nowadays. But at that time, people concentrated a lot in urban areas without the proper public health systems and services that affected mortality in a negative way. And he kind of saw that population as a whole, the total number of men and women in a specific population, they were kind of like similar. So the population was kind of like equally distributed by, by sex. Why? And he was able to analyze based on that kind of, that kind of data. He saw that more boys were born than girls, the male birth rate was higher than the female birth rate. 
And we're going to talk about that throughout the whole semester, the sex ratio at birth. We much get the number of boys born in a specific place in a specific year divided by the number of girls. And that number is usually, and if you multiply by 100, that number is usually above 100%. You have more boys being born than girls. And we're going to talk more about this. So less females are born than males. One major theory about that reason is kind of like a biological, a biological way that our body is adapted to the fact that there is this hypothesis called the uh, fragile male hypothesis, that baby boys are more fragile than um, baby girls. They need more resources. So their risk of dying is higher when they are really, really, they are, when they're newborn. So in some way, nature adapted that more boys were born than girls because more boys will die faster than girls. Right? So that's called the, fem the fragile male hypothesis. You can even Google that. That's more related to biological studies. But he also realized 